So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mayor Val Vandenbroek, and I'd like to call the March 8th, 2021 regular council meeting to order and begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the traditional unceded territory of the KC Kwantlen, Masqui, and Semiamu First Nations. And for any members of the public who are in attendance watching these proceedings, welcome. And just a reminder to keep your mics and your camera turned off while you are in attendance. Um, before I introduce everyone, I'd just like to say happy International Women's Day to everyone. And I know I'm very grateful for all the amazing women in my life that lift me up. So please say uh, no to no more stigma, no more silence, no more stereotypes, no more discrimination, no more systematic barriers, no more gender norms, and no more, no more violence against women and girls. And it's time to make women's rights and gender equality a reality. So choose to challenge and make a commitment to women everywhere to stand up for human rights and join in to raise our voices for an equal future. So here's just strong women and may we know them. So with me today, I have Councillor Paul Albrecht, Councillor Terry James, Councillor Gail Martin, Councillor Nathan Bahal, Councillor Rudy Stortaboom and Councillor Rosemary Wallace. Staff, we have our Chief Administrative Officer, Francis Chung, uh, Darren Light, our Director of Corporate Services, Carl Johansson, our Director of Development Services, Rick Baumhoff, our Director of Engineering Parks and Environment, Mahira uh, Gil, Gil, who's our Manager of Engineering, Kim Hilton, our Director of Recreation, Culture and Community Services, Kelly Kenny, our corporate officer. And I believe that is all for today. So we're gonna get on with the adoption of the agenda, adoption of the March 8th, 2021 regular agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the motion is that the March 8th, 2021 agenda be adopted as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Albrecht, Councillor James, all those in favor, and oppose, that carries. Adoption of the minutes from the regular meeting minutes from February 22nd, 2021, that the minutes of the regular meeting held on February 22nd, 20, 2021 be adopted as circulated. We're gonna seconder, any corrections on that? I have Councillor Storterboom, seconder on that, please. Councillor James. Any discussion and corrections? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Uh, special pre closed meeting minutes that the minutes of the special pre closed meeting held on March 1st, 2021, be adopted as circulated. We were in a seconder. Councillor Sturdeboom, Councillor Albrecht, any corrections? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Okay, so first up, we have some delegations. We have Kathy Peters here for Be Amazing Campaign to End Sexual Exploitation. So welcome, Ms. Peters. Hi there, I hope everybody can hear me. Thank you, your worship. Today is International Women's Day, and it is also Stop the Sexual Exploitation of Children and Youth Awareness Week. Human sex trafficking and sexual exploitation for the purpose of prostitution is the fastest growing crime in the world and it is here. So what is human trafficking? It's recruiting, transporting, transferring, receiving, holding, concealing, harboring, or exercising control over a person for the purpose of exploiting them. The key word is exploitation. This is modern day slavery. Here are some stats. 13 years old is the average age of recruitment into the sex industry, it is much younger for Indigenous girls. 54% are Indigenous. They are severely overrepresented in the sex industry. It's up to about 80% in the downtown east side. And this is shocking, 82% involved in prostitution had childhood sexual abuse or incest, which is preparation for prostitution later on. 72% live with PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress dis disorder, so trauma needs to be addressed. 95% in prostitution want to leave. It is not a choice. 
It is not a job. 86% have housing needs. So homelessness makes them vulnerable. 82% need drug rehabilitation because drugs and the sex industry go together. So I've been raising awareness about sexual exploitation and specifically child sexual exploitation and trafficking now to every city council, MLA, MP and police agency in BC since the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act became federal law in 2014 so that the police would enforce it so the public would understand it and be able to report it. So the law has three parts. Number one, it targets the demand by targeting the buyer of sex, the predator, trafficker, pimp, facilitator, John, buyer of sex are criminalized. Number two, it recognizes the seller of sex as a victim, usually female, and is not criminalized. Number three, there's exit strategies put in place to help the victim out of the sex trade. Now we're not doing any of these very well in British Columbia. This law focuses on the source of the harm, the buyers of sex and the profiteers. The clear statement from parliament was that girls and women in Canada are not for sale. Here's the RCMP poster. They are full human beings with dignity and human rights. So Vancouver and Toronto are global sex tourism hotspots. And this is shocking. Canada is now known as a child sex tourism destination. So the sex industry is growing fast. It's targeting our children because that's where the money is. It's fueled by the internet where most of the luring is taking place. So contributing factors are globalization, unregulated technology, no surprise, limited law enforcement, and very little prevention education. And that's the piece that I do. So Canada has a national human trafficking hotline now, line number. And I did send you a wallet card with that. And also we have OC tip, which is our provincial helpline number. Pornography is fueling the sex industry and creating the market for commercially paid sex. Men and boys are the buyers of sex and are the key to end exploitation. Now, VPD gave me this line, it's a good one. Boys and men must understand that there's a sacred part of the woman they have no right to. And I gave that statement to all the BC Indigenous chiefs two weeks ago who I presented to, along with the Federal Minister of Justice, David Lametti. So what can you do in the city of Langley? The main thing you can do is train your uh, business licensing managers on what to look for when granting business licenses. So unregistered massage and body rub parlors, nail spas, holistic health centers, day spas, modeling agencies, tattoo parlors, escort services, cheap bars and hotels, men's clubs, Airbnb, VRBO, casinos, strip clubs, organized crime clubhouses are all typical covers for sex trafficking and exploitation. Now regarding hotels and motels, Ontario's best practices globally to curb trafficking, they are mandating registration of every guest that is in the hotel room. So BC is getting further and further behind every province in Canada, both in enforcing the federal law and in raising awareness with prevention education. So BC is the best place by far in Canada to buy and sell women and children for sex. Public awareness in BC is completely lacking. The media has a pro-sex industry narrative here in BC, making it very difficult to counter. That is why I have sent information packages to every city council in BC to warn you all of this rapidly growing crime. So I have a couple of asks. First of all, could I present to your law enforcement and to any community safety committee? That would be the big thing. Um, secondly, could you alert the Premier and the Solicitor General that this crime is a priority in BC. We need funding for law enforcement and a provincial awareness campaign. We also need an interagency, as long, human sex trafficking task force similar to what's available for drugs and gangs. This is what they have in Manitoba and Ontario. And could you write a letter of support? Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Peters. Um, great that you're educating everyone. I think that's absolutely fantastic. It's just sad that you have to do it for that reason, right? Um, but good on you for taking that on and educating all of us. So thank you for that. 
Um, anybody have any questions or Councillor Storterboom, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Ms. Peters, for your excellent presentation. Very straightforward, easy to understand, stick to the facts and passionate. Um, one of the best presentations uh, about something that really, really matters to me as well. Um, I support your initiatives and uh, I recognize that, uh, especially today, um, we as a society must change our ways and how we see each other. And that's for all people, but especially around the issue of human trafficking and sex exploitation. Thank you very much for your presentation. I support you and your initiative wholeheartedly. Thank you, Councillor Wallace, and then Councillor Alpeck. Thank you uh, for your presentation, and uh, it's a very emotional one, um, one that's needed across British Columbia, across Canada. I don't think we're aware of how much is happening. And just to your ask, um, I guess, it, I mean, I fully support your ask in writing letters and supporting in whatever way possible to end. Um, Human, traffic, human trafficking and the whole, you know, your whole point about social media and just the luring that happens on social media is just, it's just another big problem. So thank you for bringing it forward. Um, we know it exists. I don't think we know how much it exists, but thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, anybody else have any questions or comments? Oh, sorry, Councilor Albrecht, I had you down. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, um, as a father and a grandfather of, uh, of a daughter and a granddaughter, this is sickening and, and um, irrepre irreprehensible uh, behavior. And, and it's, it's a shame that it's still continuing on. And, um, for one of your asks, I would uh, I would encourage our bylaws staff to get in contact with you to have uh, a, a dialogue and a presentation on uh, the things to look for in uh, some of the businesses that you highlighted, uh, because uh, I, for one, on council, wouldn't want that type of uh, business in our community, and um, I think they need to be uh, taken care of and drummed out of here and. Um, I'm not going to speak for all of council, but I would be more than happy to send a letter to the province and to the um, uh, the, the appropriate police agencies to get um, the right, um, uh, let's say, enforcement activities and um, and awareness of of this uh, in in all our communities. It has to stop. It has to end. Um, tomorrow isn't soon enough. So uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor James. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I'm gonna suggest that as a delegate, you get five minutes, and I know that's tricky. I would like to expand your time and hear more about this. So I'm gonna suggest that you be um, brought into a brief, you give a half an hour or something like that so that we can genuinely talk about this. This is a serious concern. Um, Everyone has expressed it. I can tell by everyone's faces that they're deeply moved by what you said. And your very succinct presentation was outstanding, by the way. So um, if you, I, I'm gonna suggest to staff and the mayor that um, you be given more time than this to explain everything that you're talking about. So I'm gonna pursue that going forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Did you have more information, Kathy, or would you like? I, I do want to share with you, I had the privilege of presenting to all the BC Indigenous chiefs for the province, which was absolutely outstanding. And the fact that David Lametti was there, the federal justice minister, everybody was deeply moved. If you're watching the news, the Indigenous are being aggressively targeted all over BC. They're being um, abducted or potential abductions. Um, so they are reaching out to me continually. They're afraid to report to the police. And, and the fact that it's International Women's Day, I just think the timing of this presentation today is, is perfect. But it's also the whole week is to stop sexual exploitation awareness week for youth. I, I want you to understand you're close to the border with the states. When that border opens, the Americans come up here to buy sex. 
that is what is happening. Um, and Canada has a potential to turn into America's brothel. Now, the good news is we have a fantastic law in place. We can't lose that law. We need to have that law enforced, which is not being enforced in BC. So that's why I say to Mike Farnworth, every girl under 14 and some boys are being aggressively targeted by a hungry sex industry where there's no deterrent. So the fact that you're in Langley, you're close to Vancouver. Again, Vancouver is an entry point into Canada. Um, and, and it's a hot spot for, for the sex industry. And the, and the city has developed a bit of a permissive stance. It will affect all of the lower mainland. And now it's affecting all of BC. So it really is my cry for help. I, I try to reach out to media all the time. CKNW, uh, CBC, they, pro, they, they really are staying pro-sex industry. And I'm not getting a chance to present. So that's why I've, <laughs> I've resorted to, to speaking to every city council that I can. Well, I'm glad you are because raising awareness and education is key, right? Uh, Councillor Wallace and then Councillor Martin. Thank you. And I really appreciated um, Councillor James' suggestion. I think we need to go more and we need to be proactive in just the educating, you know, how are we going to educate people? So my ask for you is, is, is there, I know because it's a week long um, awareness campaign, I don't know if it's a campaign, but awareness week. Is there something that you could send to us that we could put up onto our social media so that we can be proactive in um, you know, the right kind of information, um, putting it out there on social media? Because it's immediate, it's been a, it, it's an immediate situation um, crisis um, and anything that we could do to help or you know, bring awareness to it this week and, and that continual awareness by hopefully you coming back and um, we having a fuller conversation. So if there's something that you could send our way to put up on social media, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Great, Councillor Martin. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, you mentioned the age limit, the age that this is happening at. What um, what do the school boards do to reach out to, to the kids? I mean, it seems to me that that would be one of the places to get a message across to, the, to those in that age bracket. Absolutely. I just want to clarify too, in Surrey, I work with the youth workers, outreach workers in Surrey. The ages now that the sex traffickers are, are targeting is 10 to 12. That's grade four, grade five and grade six. And the traffickers now, COVID's made this much worse, everybody. <laughs> COVID has really done it because it's all happening online. But these traffickers now are serious. They're organized. It's so much money involved. They can get a grade four girl, 10-year-old girl in 24 hours. Once she's in the sex trade, she develops a trauma bond with her perpetrator, Stockholm syndrome. They are, I mean, they will not report. They fall in love. I mean, it's just, it's just dreadful. But that's what's happening all around the lower mainland. So, I mean, the school boards are very key in this. I've really focused on um, civic, uh, provincial, and the federal government and working closely with police. I haven't even started going towards school boards, but if you could recommend or open that door for me, I'm happy to do a presentation to them as well. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think that the school board would be one of the best places to start, uh, especially, I mean, a 10-year-old, my God, uh, it's just... It's unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. So I think whatever we can do to, to get the message across, uh, I mean, I have no idea, idea how these guys approach them. I've seen some movies on sex trafficking and that, and I'm sure it's fairly realistic, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, a 10 year old, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Sturdivant, go ahead. You're on mute. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I know I've had my go already, but I, I want to reiterate how much I appreciate your presentation. Very concise and comprehensive, but I can see that there's still a lot to this particular conversation that uh, is available. You see things that we don't, and we need to be made aware of what to look for, not just as a council, but as a community and a culture. Um, if it is available to attend maybe a workshop or something in the future, I'd be happy to attend. I look forward to hearing more of what you have to say and learning from you because 
Education will be the key to a brighter future. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you, Councillor Stortebim. Uh, any other comments? For... I don't see any. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Peters, and we'll be in touch and we'll get you the contact info to get a hold of the school board. And um, yeah, any more information you can send us to um, educate the public, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to the section of mayor's report. Uh, next upcoming meetings, regular council meeting is March 22nd, 2021. And then the following one is April 12th, 2021. And we have a report, library happenings with Councillor Martin. Thank you very much. Okay, the library re report. Um, you can join your fellow needle crafters for a fun afternoon of relaxing, stitching, and sharing of projects. I don't know why the screen is blank. <clears throat> Me neither. Sorry, I'm trying to get this up and running. <clears throat> it's in Teams today instead of our typical because the file was so big. Let me just get this going again. Where did it go? I always feel like I should be playing some sort of music or something while we were having technical difficulties. Yeah, I apologize. No <laughs> worries. Ms. Okay, here it is. So I'll share it with you. So you can see that? Yes. I'll try and go full screen so you don't see the advancing slides and see what happens. There we go. Great. Okay. So we'll, we'll start at slide two again, Kim. You can join your fellow needle crafters for a fun afternoon of relax, relaxing stitching and sharing of projects. Next slide. You can join our author, Anna Borge author of the more or less definitive guide to self care for a discussion of her work and all things self care. Make any day a little more okay with new skills in your self care toolkit and energy to show up for yourself. Science World comes to your house in this fast moving fun interactive collection of their most popular science demonstrations and activities. Next slide, scratch developed by MIT, helps young kids to learn to think creat creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. Essential skills for life is the 21st century for school-age kids. They will learn to create their own computer and Minecraft theme games and animation animations with Scratch using drag and drop programming. Um, join us for a book lovers discussion, literary insights optional, library staff will share their current favorite reads. If you have a book or two you'd like to tell the group about, we'd love to hear it. And you could grab a flashlight, some blankets and pull the pillows off the couch. It's family forts in the afternoon. Join us in your cozy fort and bring your family's favorite reads. We'll show off our forts and have some fun reading together. All uked up and no place to jam. All levels of experience are welcome at our fun and relaxed virtual ukulele circle. And it's open to adults 18 plus. And got a balcony, a driveway, a tiny backyard. Then you, you can container garden. Whether you're into flowers or vegetables or both, you can join us for a discussion of full of tips, ideas, and success stories. And I'm just going to add, um, if, if it's okay with, with council, just a couple of statistics that um, the January physical search circulation of virtual program um, statistics are in, and they've increased substantially. We averaged over 10,600 checkouts per day of books, DVDs, and other physical materials, which is over a thousand more per day than our previous highest week in November, 2020. 
Similarly, we had over 24,000 views of our virtual story times and other programs in January, and more than 300 views of our virtual programs since launching them in April 2020. Um, we've just launched uh, this year's version of the popular program, A Thousand Stories Before Kindergarten. This program supports parents in reading to their preschool age children to support strong early literacy. The program was reworked to support virtual registration and now includes a monthly newsletter filled with early literacy information. The program has a lot of popularity and we're expecting high levels of registration over the next couple of weeks. So I just wanted to bring to your attention the uh, how important the libraries are to our community, especially during this time of basically isolation. Um, 10,600 checkouts a day. That's, that's a lot of books and DVDs. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for that report. I have Councillor Wallows, Councillor Bahal, and then Councillor James. Thank you once again, Councillor Martin, for your report and then the statistics, uh, reporting out on the statistics at the very end. Um, through the early literacy, do they share with the, um, the school district um, about all of the, the programs that you just shared? Do you, know if, do you know if that goes out to the school district? Just because there's so much value in it there, it seems like the library is on top of things that are really popular right now, like the ukulele, right? You go to uh, rent a ukulele, you can't rent a ukulele. The um, growing gardens, that, that, that theme, it seems like they touch on a whole different um, spectrum of, of themes. So I'm wondering if how that messaging would get to the school district to be filtered out to all of the schools before spring break. Uh, before spring break. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, it's a good point. Um, I could ask uh, Heather Scholar, our, she basically looks after all the programming for, for the libraries to see how it is. I'd be surprised if it wasn't sent out to the school districts, but uh, I'll certainly check. I've got an executive meeting on Wednesday and I'll certainly check on that. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Bahal. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, and through the Mayor, Councillor Martin. It's always great hearing your reports on what's happening in the library. I appreciate that. Uh, and I also really enjoyed the statistics. It's, it's good to know that circulation is up and that the library's role is ever changing from when it was you know, in person to dynamic. It, it, it's there for our community. So as, as the chair, I know you're the chair of the, the library committee. Do you think it may be able to get a presentation on overall statistics at some point in the future uh, about library services uh, for council at a future meeting, just sort of a state of the library service from staff perhaps? I'm sure Scott Hargrove, our CIO, would be more than happy to come and attend uh, one of our council meetings. So I will mention that to him on Wednesday when I see him. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great, thanks, good suggestion. Uh, who did I have next? Councillor James. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to uh, reiterate what everyone has said. Councillor Martin, as our representative at the Library Board and as the chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Library, you bring so much information. It is so appreciated. And I can't help but think as a grandmother of four that you... The, the stuff you bring is so relevant. It's clear to me that the library is trying so hard to stay engaged and involved and it's fast becoming one of the best things in our community. So I just genuinely want to thank you for the information you bring forward because it's very valued. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, you know, the staff uh, at, at uh, Fraser Valley Regional Library work really hard and, and they've worked especially hard during this time because they know that people are isolated in their homes or staying at home. Uh, there's not a whole lot that, that you can do. Um, you know, the story times, uh, I, I never, I mean, I knew about them before, but I save every story time. And I know when my grandchildren spend the night uh, they have two story times before bedtime and, and you know, they laugh and, and you know, it's, it's wonderful. So as a grandmother of four, 
you might want to check out uh, downloading some of the story times because some of the stories are, are really, really good. Uh, but, but thank you. I, I give all the credit to our staff uh, at the library for, for what they bring forward. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments for? Okay, moving right along, we have engineering update next with uh, Mr. Rick Baumhoff, our Director of Engineering Parks and Environment. All right, thank you very much. And I will share my screen. So it's an update for March of 2021. It's amazing how the first quarter is just uh, right on us. Um, the first shot we have is the, um, the two shelters, uh, two of the shelters at City Park. The slabs were poured um, incorrectly, so they had to be removed. And uh, so that's the shot you see here. And they will be re-poured. Uh, the, the goal is for this week, later this week, to have them all re-poured. In use uh, for later this spring, and once all this grass has been seeded and uh, it won't it won't uh, kill the grass, then it'll be ready for use by the public. This is a picture of uh, in in regards to asset management. As you know, we've spent uh, considerable effort um, focusing on our the city assets, and this is a shot just showing of the planned. 2021 video inspection of the sanitary sewers and that'll be completed between March to June of this year. And it's the uh, clouded areas in blue that will be videoed this year. So what that does is it, it tells us the condition of the pipe, if there's any uh, infil infiltration or roots or problems with the pipes that those are identified and then put on a list for, for repairs. And it's the same for our uh, storm sewer system. And the blue lines are the ones that are slated for uh, completion of video inspection this year. This is an aerial shot of just the plan of the crosswalk at the, uh, it's a rapid flashing beacons with the crosswalk at 208 Street and 45A. Uh, the contractor is scheduled to start this week so will you, you will start to see some activities uh, in that area. This is a shot of the pedestrian bridge reinstalled across the Nicomeco River at Portage Park. And as you can see, it's uh, greatly cleaned up and um, the, the bridge itself was in excellent structural condition. So we don't have a concern that way, uh, just needed to be refurbished. And of course the, the paint was old uh, lead-based paint. So it could not be done just over the river. It had to be removed and put back in service. And the next shot is showing, you know, we, the contractors now moved over to the 208th Street uh, pedestrian overpass and it's partially removed in this shot. And that'll be back in commission in about five weeks. This is a shot of our, uh, some of the air release valves throughout the city. So it's on our, on our water system, as well as any sanitary force mains, wherever the pipe is, uh, has a peak in it, the air can accumulate there. And um, unless it's released, uh, it can cause problems in the operation of the, of the system. So those are rebuilt and uh, maintained uh, on a regular basis. This is a shot of a water meter uh, replacement program on Industrial Avenue. It's a large diameter uh, water meter. Uh, this is a shot of uh, sanitary, sewer, uh, sanitary to storm sewer cross connection repair. Uh, it's part of our uh, you know, program to fix those things whenever there's a cross connection, uh, either a storm into sanitary and, and worse yet is where sanitary goes into storm. For some reason, uh, whether it was an error in construction years ago, um, and we find those from time to time. And I will, we have some slides later on where I'll, I'll show you some of the smoke detection that's been done to identify some of these uh, cross connections. 
And this is a shot of uh, graffiti removal on the 204th Street overpass. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the before pictures and, and maybe it was obscenities, I, I don't know, but um, uh, we do have a program where if the public call in uh, about graffiti, we try to get to it uh, at least you know within 24 hours. Uh, if it's obscenities, we try to get to it immediately. So that um, this is general information for the public, if they do see it, to please call it in and use the request for service pro, uh, uh, package or uh, that's available on our website. If they use that, they get a quick response telling them that it's been put into our system and they'll get a response once it's been fixed as well, what they're dealt with. So as I mentioned, uh, we did the complete uh, 2020 smoke testing in our water, uh, sanitary system. And this map here, so I'll have to just, uh, where, I can't see it with my screen here. Um, so the area 5.1 and 6 over by the Langley Bypass on 56th area, that was, uh, uh, we did smoke testing. So what happens is um, the catchment areas that have the highest uh, inflow and infiltration rates in the city and also flows to pump stations um, where we can identify savings on pump lifespans and power usage can be realized. We identify those areas and uh, do some testing as a priority area. The contractor inserts uh, what we call a smoke bomb into the sewers and they record observed smoke from the ground or houses. And here's a shot where it shows uh, four locations of smoke coming out of either catch basins, um, you know, drains in the area. So it's clear that those are uh, where storm flows run into, they will go right into the sanitary sewer, which causes very high peak flows, you can well imagine, during high rainfall events, uh, which is always a concern, at, especially at pump stations. And crews will be uh, working to correct those. And the next steps is to complete more smoke testing uh, next year, likely in catchment four and seven and complete as many repairs as possible with inflow and infiltration uh, budgets available. And then the next step is a complete and uh, inflow and infiltration flow monitoring as part of the sewer master plan uh, this year to compare current rates to historical rates and assess how the city is performing. The idea obviously being to try and reduce that number and um, you know, reduce the amount of inflow. And that's my presentation, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. Your crew is always busy and doing great work around the city. So thank you. And I always learn so much when you give your presentations. I, it's pretty cool. Um, I just do have a quick question. I know the bridge, um, there was some concerns about, and it looks fantastic, by the way. Uh, took the dogs over it the other day, um, much better. Uh, somebody did raise the concern with me though, in regards to COVID and the length of the bridge uh, or the width of the bridge. Um, do we need to put signs up to yield to other pedestrians coming with the flow through or is it six? Are we socially distanced enough that people are crossing each other or could we look into that please maybe? Yeah, thanks. Okay. And I, um, we had had discussions with the health department last year because as you know, all, all of our sidewalks or most of them are, you know, 1.5 meters. So, uh, you know, you're gonna, when you come across another pedestrian, you're gonna be within the six feet. So, uh, and that's acceptable. When you're outdoors and you're passing by each other, it's not an issue or concern from a COVID spreading situation. So, there is no need to put up signage to uh, indicate to, to uh, residents or, or pedestrians about that concern. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I honestly did not see who popped their hands up first. So I'm just gonna go by my screen if that's okay with you folks, Councillor Storderboom, Councillor Wallace, and then Councillor Pahal. And then uh, Councillor Albrecht. <laughs> thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Bonhoff, for your uh, 
report uh, always fascinates me as to uh, what you and your team are doing. Uh, I think you uh, and your team are doing a great job for us. The city of Langley is in great shape. However, I am surprised at the prospect of having uh, a sewer system running into a storm sewer. Um, this is especially surprising because I am under the impression that the city of Langley is actually in better shape with regard to our infrastructure than uh, a lot of municipalities across Canada. Would you agree with me that the city of Langley's infrastructure is uh, better than average? Or, I mean, I know there's still a lot of work to do. Um, uh, it's just that this, uh, this thing where the, the sewer goes into the storm sewer in some places, uh, it really caught me by surprise. That seems almost medieval to me. Um, just an overview, can you advise me that we're in good shape compared to others, please? You know, we, our assets are in, I would say, reasonable condition. And I, I do believe um, the city does a very good job in managing them. Um, having said that, um, there, there is a deficit in uh, to replace all of our infrastructure that, you know, we will be facing more and more as the, as the infrastructure ages to, to be, have a more concerted effort to to work and, and obviously allocate budgets to, to deal with those issues. But in this situation on infiltration, I, I would say we're in, this is not uncommon. And I, our, our inflow and infiltrations, even though this was a higher area uh, for infiltration, these are the kind of programs that identify that. And we're, we're lower than many other communities. We're lower infiltration rates, even with these kind of problems. You know, there are many other municipalities, especially like into Vancouver, uh, Burnaby, where you have combined sewer systems, you know, with a, a major initiative to reduce and, and, uh, and separate those sewers out. In the city of Langley, we don't have um, uh, combined sewers. So this is the worst kind of infiltration inflow that, that you can get. But uh, overall, I would say we're in, in good shape. Thank you very much for your overview. I have every confidence in you and your team. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Thank you through the mayor to Mr. Baumhoff. Um, thank you again for your report. I always learn something from your report and oftentimes we don't, um, knowing what's underground, we don't see. So you always share so much valuable information. My question is, um, in regards to the re, uh, graffiti removal on the 204th Street overpass, if there's any, um, has there en ever been any talk of maybe doing something very simple, a sim simple mural there? Um, and just maybe an idea. I know we don't want something to be distracting drivers, but maybe there's something that be that could be done that is simple. Um, just a thought that uh, came to me, but thank you for your report. Mm -hmm. We, we can um, look into that for sure. I, and I, I'd have to, uh, yeah, we'd have to discuss that internally, just how that we could make something like that happen. It could be even a wrap. It could be a, a wrap of nature or something. I don't know. It could be just something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Greenery. Uh, Councillor Bahal. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to Mr. Baumhoff. Uh, and I guess just tagging into what Councillor Wallace said, I know as a good example, there's the bridge on Terminal Avenue in Vancouver that has a lot of concrete around it, and they have a bunch of different mural panels. And there's another one on Beatty uh, by the parkade by the old Canada Post Office as examples of how that seems to have worked quite nice. But uh, to my original question, it was rather dramatic seeing these pictures of the smoke coming out. Um, but I guess the question um, I have is what is Metro Vancouver doing for the infiltration? I recall reading somewhere that they were getting quite serious about this and I'm not sure what their plan was or were they making funding available? Maybe you could provide some info on that. And then I have one other question for you. Thanks. I don't 
think they've provided any funding. I've not heard of any programs, but um, I know they are looking at this far more seriously than they have in the past. As you know, every drop of uh, what's collected in the sewer system has to be treated before it is, is discharged. So when you have high water, high rainfall events, uh, sometimes there's overflows and there's, like I said, more significant issues in, in the, the further you go west. Um, so, but I can look into that if, if there's, uh, I check with Metro to see if there's any funding programs for that. Yeah, and I don't know if it was that or if they were being more punitive or I just was wondering, I just recall reading it somewhere and that they were, this was all of a sudden really on their radar now. I, I don't believe they're going to go to uh, penalties. It's, it's more they want to see municipalities proactive and doing their part to, to solve this problem. So as long as you're doing that, I, I, don't, I don't think they'll be uh, sending or issuing penalties. Okay. Uh, and I guess the other question with that is I also read that Metro Vancouver, I guess I have a couple more questions for you. Metro Vancouver was looking at like beefing up their water metering and tracking. Will that have any impact on the city, do you think? Because I guess they were looking at water loss as well. Um, do you know anything about that? Uh, well, they, I've heard, you know, there's been discussion for many years about universal water metering. And oh, sorry, um, if I may interrupt, it was more for them metering this, like enhancing their metering to us, like as a bulk user. So they were looking at enhancing how they track water they saw to Langley City. Uh, again, I have not heard that. Okay, cool. Um, sorry about that. And then I guess the final question for you is, I know the, how often does the city look at when, the sort of repairs around our maintenance and in, in inspection ports. Like I know that um, residents can obviously call in, but does the city, like how often is that something we do in the spring or is it kind of just part of people's jobs as they're doing regular road maintenance? How does that work? So for inspection of what, sorry, I missed. So on our, like the uh, maintenance, um, ports or manholes uh, and the, the connections for like water, like to turn the water on and off and sewer on and off in units. I've noticed some of them are kind of rusted out in a few areas. I've reported them sometimes. I know residents have. Does the city also have any active programs for that or is it more based on the complaints we receive? We do a valve, if that's the question, the valve exercising, we do a proactive valve exercising to ensure that all the valves work, especially in an emergency, we'll need to be able to turn them off. Yeah. So that's an important program that we have. Um, are you talking about services at the shutoffs at, at property lines or is that? Yeah, like on the streets, there's the covers that you would open and some of them I've just noticed uh, have they're rusted through now so you could actually see down. They're the small okay. ones probably no bigger than this. Oh, okay, those so those are the valve boxes. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, there is a program, and actually, one of the pictures I could have put up is their maintenance of those and and oh, repainting, okay. and putting them back in service. But I, I didn't select that one to show. But there is a program to inspect those and replace them if needed. Uh, that's encouraging to hear. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you do find any information about Metro Vancouver's bulk water meters or if there's anything they're doing to mm -hmm. encourage uh, communities to get better with their um, infiltration, that would be really interesting to hear in the future. And also kudos for the rehabilitation of the bridge. I know some residents commented that uh, it was more cost effective than putting in a new bridge by like quarter of the cost. So doing things like this is, is great. And I like that we're looking at how we can rehabilitate our infrastructure and not necessarily just completely replace it. So thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, yeah. Madam Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor Albrecht. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. Um, yeah, just some of the comments from uh, other members of council about the uh, the smoke and the in infiltration. 
Um, I think we, we need to remember that a lot of these uh, utilities were put in some 30 or 40 years ago and technology has changed quite a bit and, and our ability to, to, uh, to check and see the efficiencies or non-efficiencies. And, and I think this is a great program to, uh, to help save uh, taxpayer dollars uh, into, um, into uh, waste treatment or water treatment facilities that are, that are unnecessary or that they should be. So uh, this is a, an excellent program to get some um, deficiencies in our systems all sorted out. Uh, but the biggest question I had was going back to the crosswalk and um, considering the time of year and it's still rainy and, and, and the sun goes out quickly, um, I'm just wondering what the plans are for some advance uh, notice signs uh, going both north and south uh, to advise drivers of this, uh, this change to our uh, road uh, network. So if you could maybe touch on that, please. <laughs> Yeah, there are advanced signs uh, outside of the, I, I snip, I took a little snippet of this uh, picture of the design drawing, but there are further, you know, signs further down the road to identify and let people know that the sign is ahead. But, you know, one significant benefit to this overhead, you know, it has like a, it's a big overhead sign, so people will readily see a significant change and when it does when the rapid flashing beacons go um it, it definitely will get drivers attentions and, and you'll see the the little um i forget what they call those little marks on the road indicating that oh, there's okay. a crosswalk ahead you see yeah. those on the plan so they will also be in the pavement okay great thank you Councillor Storderboom, did you have another question? Not really, but actually, since you did call on me, um, I can't help but be curious uh, about something associated with this crosswalk too, in that um, there is um, a painted traffic island in the middle of this particular section of 208 Street. Um, I don't suppose, though, that there might be uh, uh, a place uh, on that island that could be considered uh, uh, designated, uh, you know, safe for pedestrians. I, I, I have a concern about this particular location and the, the volume and the speed of the traffic. And I just can't help but be curious if it might be available to incorporate some kind of a, a safe zone in the middle. Uh, just wondering, thanks for calling on me. Thanks again, Mr. Bonhoff. Yeah, in this specific location, there there is no median. It's just a yellow line in the middle of the road. So uh, unlike further down, lower down on the road and uh, uh, beyond north of 48, there's a median there where there is a refuge spot. In this location, there isn't. Thank you very much again for your report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you. Great, any other comments or questions for Mr. Baumhoff? I don't see any, so thank you very much. All right, and moving on to bylaws now. Uh, Langley Lyons Housing Agreement, bylaw number 3134. And I believe Mr. Johansson is gonna be giving us a presentation. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, today we're bringing forward a housing agreement bylaw uh, that represents a significant step forward uh, towards the start of the proposed redevelopment of the Langley Lions site, starting with the 101 unit Birch building replacement. Now, this proposed bylaw, if adopted by Council, will secure the Birch building as 100% rental building, as a 100% rental building for the life of this building and ensure that 80% of the units are moderate income rental units, otherwise known as affordable rental. 50% uh, of the units are rent geared toward income units and 20% are deep subsidy units. And that at least 80% of the total units in the Birch will be for seniors age 55 and above. These percentages are exactly consistent with those identified in the December 9th, 2019 report to council 
that presented the official committee plan or OCP amendment, rezoning bylaws for the laying lines redevelopment. And they're also consistent with what was presented at the public hearing uh, in January of last year. I also know these percent percentages also reflect the requirements of the BC Housing Community Housing Fund model that is being used to finance the construction of the Birch Building. Once adopted by Council, this housing agreement will appear on uh, the property title and in priority order and include measures to ensure that these percentages are adhered to. Future phases of the Langley Lines redevelopment, such as the second phase Alder Building, which we expect to uh, follow fast on the heels of the Birch Building, uh, will each require their own individual housing agreements that will come forward to Council. Staff recommend three readings of this bylaw and should Council grant these three readings, this bylaw will be brought back to Council for consideration of adopt adoption along with the OCP amendment, rezoning, and land use contract discharge bylaws, and the recommended approval of the Birch Building Development Permit. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you to all you and your staff for all the hard work on this. Um, super important. So Councillor Bahal and then Councillor Albrecht. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Mayor. And if I may, I'd like to move um, the recommendation. And we, sorry, I had to click on the mute button there. Uh, Councillor Wallace seconded. Go ahead, Councillor Pahal. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. And I'm sure a lot of the seniors that live in the Langley Lions um, area are very happy as well that we're enshrining the low income numbers as per BC housing and that 80%. Uh, I know that it's currently 86%. 0.3% today, but I know that 80% is the number that BC Housing would go for. So to ensure that that's baked in forever is super important. And I, I just wanted to say that I, I'm fully supportive of this because it ensures that this site will be affordable for generations to come. So I think it's really something we should celebrate that this is our first housing agreement. And I think it shows how much as a council, I hope we're supportive of making sure we have affordable rentals in our community. And it definitely shows that staff is supportive. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And you're confirming the motion of that the bylaw cited as the Langley Lions Seniors District Housing Agreement 2021 bylaw number 3134 be read a first, second, and third time. Yes. Uh, and you. I apologize, Madam Mayor, for jumping the gun on that. No, that is fine. I don't mind at all. We just got to go back and do what we need to do. So um, I believe Councillor Albrecht, you are next, and then Councillor Stortaboom. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, I want to echo uh, Councillor Pahal's uh, uh, previous uh, uh, points. This is a, a very, very good agreement uh, for, for the city. And as he noted, it is the first one for the city. Uh, and, and it's something that goes a long ways towards providing the kind of um, options for housing and, um, and providing uh, the support for people that need it and in our community, um, both uh, young and old. And I think it's um, a, a really positive step uh, for uh, the housing continuum here in the city and aligns perfectly with our plans and our vision to start to develop the kind of community and city that we want to see where everyone can, can live, play and uh, work in our community uh, for generations and generations. So um, I'm fully supportive of this agreement. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Sturdivum, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you for the comments of my previous uh, of my council colleagues previously. Um, I, I too am very um, excited about this initiative. I see it as the next step in the redevelopment of that particular site. And I think it is a model and an example for other municipalities in our region. Um, I'm uh, uh, especially excited to see this happening uh, at this time. And uh, I just hope that I can, you know, see every phase, every part uh, completed. Now, 
Um, I do have uh, a couple of concerns as much as I've, I've looked through the agreement that's being promoted and I, I accept the, uh, the resolution uh, as it's being presented. Um, when we had a public open hearing, there was some question about um, disruption during the time of construction. And I know that the Langley Lodge people in particular were concerned about uh, how the site was being accessed for the replacement of the birch. Um, they had concerns about construction, parking, uh, noise, and uh, also the time frame. not just, you know, what days, but what hours and when it would start and how long it would take. Um, any, any comments on that for us, uh, Mr. Johansson? Uh, yes, uh, through the mayor to Councillor Storderboom. Uh, yeah, before they uh, uh, move ahead uh, towards construction, we would expect that a construction management plan would be uh, submitted by uh, uh, the applicant and the contractor so that we can ensure that uh, construction uh, activity does not disrupt the uh, Langley Lodge. And uh, it's similar to other uh, rezonings uh, applications where you know we expect trades parking to be uh, contained uh, on site, not uh, on other properties or, or on the street. And uh, uh, I would I would expect that the Langley Alliance would be in communication with the Langley Lodge regarding construction hours along with their contractor. And uh, we expect that that would all be uh, included in their construction management plan. Thank you very much, Mr. Johansson. It, it was not too much trouble when you do get that plan. Would you uh, consider maybe um, connecting with the executive at the lodge because they are so immediately adjacent to this site and because they are a, a senior's uh, housing facility. Um, it would be maybe nice to, you know, let them look at the plan and uh, have them approve it or maybe offer some input to it. Just a suggestion. Thank you very much, Mr. Johansson. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, anybody else? Seeing no hands. Yeah, this is an absolutely fantastic, fantastic project and it's been years in the making and uh, it'll definitely benefit many of our citizens. So um, looking forward to it. And like I said before, staff's done a fantastic job working on this unknown territory, so to speak. So, um, and thank the Langley Lions for working with us as well. Um, you know, they, uh, I believe Jeanette is here. So um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great addition to our community. All right, so seeing no other comments, um, I guess the first, second and third reading of the bylaw to enter into a housing agreement with, um, the Langley Lions Seniors District Housing Agreement. So all those in favor, any opposed? And that carries unanimously. So thank you all. Okay, moving on. Um, next one up is the new Watercourse Protection Bylaw 2021, number 3152. Uh, a motion is that the report of the manager of engineering services dated March 8, 2021, regarding proposed new water course protection bylaw 2021, number 3152, be received for information. So moved. I uh, have a mover and a seconder, Councillor Martin, Councillor James. Any discussion on that, Councillor Albrecht, go ahead, and then Councillor Wallace. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And as one of the chairs of our environment committee, um, this is this is long overdue, and I and I really want to thank staff for bringing this forward. It's it's really an important piece of of uh, protecting our natural resources. However, uh, I I am concerned that uh, um, the uh, the fines are somewhat uh, small. Uh, Five hundred dollars uh, for some of these developers is is just the cost of doing business, and um, I would like to see once once damage is done, it can't be reversed. Um, it's or is very difficult to reverse. So I wouldn't mind seeing uh, a little bit more of an incentive to uh, to have the, the development industry uh, behave themselves and take um, serious the um, the uh, implications that, um, let's say, um, uh, inadequate work can uh, 
can have on our environment and something that is much more costly than $500 to fix. Um, so I would like to see the fines uh, beefed up substantially more. Uh, I would like to see um, uh, stop work orders placed immediately uh, to get compliance and fix the problem as well as repair the damages uh, that were incurred. So those, those are the types of things that I think we should be leading uh, the industry. I know there's other jurisdictions that, um, that have an MTI process that uh, with nominal lines, uh, but it's again uh, some of the developers that uh, that we're working with on a on a regular basis. Um, it's just a cost of doing business, and and uh, it, they're more worried about getting their product done and uh, the inventory out there for sale uh, to move on to the next project. So um, this is something that um, I think is long overdue, and I want to thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's good, uh, but I think we could use a few more teeth. So that's that's all my suggestions are at this point. So thank you. If I, if I may uh, respond. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I agree that $500 per violation may not seem that high, but uh, uh, first of all, the uh, proposed uh, fine levels are in line with all municipalities in the lower mainland. I didn't, I mean, we didn't want to go way beyond what others are asking, but we always have this stop work order uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a tool, a more effective tool. And if we want to use financial uh, damages as a, uh, a tool to discourage them to violate, that is stop work order is a much more effective to then uh, uh, increasing the fine. So uh, this fine usually is to uh, cover the staff cost of going there investigating that kind of thing. But if the violation has happened, I mean, if it is serious, the stop work, stop work order always is on the table and we can use that. So that's the main uh, tool to discourage them, not the fine itself. Great, thank you for answering that question. Uh, Councillor Albert, did you have a follow-up or were you good with that? Um, no, I, you know, it's just a, it was just a comment and, and I'm, I'm fine. Like I say, I would rather we not issue any fines and that everyone do their job correctly and that we don't have to go down this path whatsoever. So uh, I guess, yeah, the, the stop work order is, is good and, the, and repairing the damages is, is exactly what we want, but I prefer it not to occur uh, in the first place. So um, that, that's exactly. what I would be stressing more than anything else. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wallace. Thank you to, uh, through the mayor to, um, who, who am I speaking with? Um, Mr. Baumhoff and- You're on. You're out, Gil. Yeah. You're out, Gil. Um, I guess my concern um, environmentally would be how are we aligning ourselves with the township with this bylaw and the downstreaming of the, the amount of development that is happening up on the hill? I, I can't imagine the downstreaming of what happens in the waterways. So that's a concern of mine. Um, how how serious do they take this with their their building and do they have a bylaw and um, the township? Yeah. yeah. Yes, they do have. As a matter of fact, during the development of this bylaw, we looked at the uh, several other municipalities, how they are enforcing, what the language in their uh, bylaws are, and uh, we actually adopted some of them, including uh, a piece from the township. And uh, well, yeah, they are, they are enforcing that. Uh, um, this is it basically. I guess my question is just how are we aligning and it and it's good if we are aligning if we are aligning with our surrounding municipalities and our waterways meet that that is really important so that that's my you know when we look at the Nicomeco flood floodplain it connects into the you know into Surrey and then the, the building up on the hill and that water those waterways so that that was just my just in reading the report thank you for the report it was extensive and um yeah, and I, I don't know if my, my second question would relate to any of this, but what, what about businesses when it comes to um, wastewater, like, you know, pouring oil into drains and, and, and stuff like that? How, do, how does that 
They are under different kind of program. They have all interceptors, that kind of thing. But going back to your first question, we this bala is meant to control the discharge at the construction site. So coordinating with other municipalities is not a kind of thing that this bylaw talks about and is meant to be about. Um, but of course, uh, always uh, to coordinating with other municipalities when it comes to setting uh, regulations is a good idea. Uh, with the oil uh, in the, from the industry, the restaurants is under the oil uh, kind of fog program, which usually engineering operations handle that in here. Mainly this is the, um, the here, I mean, lower mainland. It is Metro Vancouver's uh, job mainly to do that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and the Mayor to uh, Mr. Gill. In what scenario would you, because I was just reading through the bylaw and the city can also um, do a repair if it's serious enough. Was that something we would consider? Because I know we have a lot of projects near water courses. So if something was going awry and you couldn't get a hold of the developer for whatever region, would the city consider um, stopping whatever bad is going on and then charge that back to the developer if there was some imminent concern like uh, I guess I'll just leave it there. Yeah, of course, if it is serious enough and they don't react uh, promptly, we will really stop the work and we'll give them some time frame to uh, uh, rectify the situation. If they fail to do that, then this bylaw allows the city to uh, go ahead and fix the problem at the developer's cost. I guess I'll just follow up. Um, if it was something that was serious enough, like um, some sort of chemical going into a stream and it's spawning time, uh, would the city act right away upon notice of that if they couldn't get to the developer on time, knowing the seriousness of the matter? Exactly. This is the whole, the whole idea. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and we would do that. Yes, of course. And we would notify uh, the, prob the Envi Ministry of Environment, you know, we have a significant issue like that, that that would be a, a very high level concern and definitely prompt action would be taken. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that answers all my questions. Great, great discussion, everyone. Uh, any other questions? All right, so I'll call the vote on receiving the information. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? That carries. And then we move on to the actual bylaw 3152, watercourse protection bylaw, first, second, and third reading of a bylaw to protect watercourses in the city of Langley. That the bylaw cited as the watercourse protection bylaw 2021, number 3152, be read a first, second, and third time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, got Councillor Storderboom and Councillor James. Any further discussion on that? Sorry, um, just wanted to ensure that council did see the email that uh, that Miss Kenny sent out updating. There was just one minor typo. Uh, so that would be the amended version of the bylaw with the proper uh, reference. Thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. I totally forgot about that. I don't have it written on my notes. So. <laughs> Okay, so uh, call the vote on that. If no one, oh, Councillor Serban, did you have Good. further discussion? Amendment. Sorry? Could I make that amendment now? Yeah, it's a friendly amendment, because I believe so, right, Ms. Kenny? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, we- uh, it's just a spelling mistake. Hadn't given it readings yet, so we thought if we just forwarded the bylaw ahead of time, that would be the one that you would face. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, so I will call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Wonderful, thank you for that clarification. All right, on to bylaw 3156, municipal ticket information system bylaw amendment. First, second, and third reading of a bylaw to amend the municipal ticket information bylaw to increase fines for the new water course protection bylaw that the bylaw cited as the Municipal Ticket Information System Bylaw 2011, number 2846, amendment number 16, 2021, number 3156, be read a first, second, and third time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Martin, Councillor Storderboom, any discussion? 
Seeing none, I will call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Bylaw 3157, fees and charges amendment bylaw for second and third reading of a bylaw to amend the fees and charges bylaw to add a fee for reinspecting a site after violation of the water course protection, after violation of the water course protection bylaw has occurred. Motion is that the bylaw cited as the fees and charges bylaw 2010 bylaw number 2837, amendment number 28, 2021, number 3157, be read a first, second, and third time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Martin, Councillor Sturdeboom. Any discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Next up, we have bylaw 3159, official community plan bylaw amendment. And I believe Mr. Johansson is going to be giving another presentation. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, this proposal, and I'll be speaking to uh, uh, the package of reports and, uh, and bylaws that you have in front of you. Uh, for two, this proposal on 207th Street, which involves a six story residential building with 68 units. Uh, the applicant has tailored their development to the proposed new official community plan or OCP land use uh, for these properties. Uh, this land use is known as low rise residential and supports four to six story apartment buildings. And it's something that's been identified on the draft land use concept for the new OCP. And it's also in the, the new draft OCP and that's been identified since early 2020. In order for the proposal to proceed in advance of the OCP, the applicant has applied for an OCP amendment uh, to allow it to go through the approval process ahead of the expected adoption of the OCP, which could occur in late April or May of this year. The applicant is also proposing to rezone the properties to a site-specific CD zone or comprehensive development zone, as no existing zones can accommodate it. This being said, the project has been designed to conform with the preliminary draft zone uh, that we're looking to include in our new zoning bylaw. Uh, in order to accommodate the, the new land use and um, accommodate such features such as the ground oriented units along 207th Street and uh, the rooftop amenity area overlooking the Nicomeco River, uh, which is consistent with the new urban design direction we're looking to add in our new OCP and the Nicomeco River District neighborhood plan. So in terms of parking, the applicant is proposing a residential parking amount that's about 4.7% less than our current zoning bylaw requirement. And while technically it's not a variance because uh, there's a proposed CD zone, it's important to note that this proposed approach is supportable based on uh, the location of this application being about 10 minute walk from uh, high frequency transit and the transit exchange on Logan Avenue and about a 10 to 15 minute walk away from the planned 203 uh, SkyTrain station. The applicant is also proposing a minor variance for visitor parking uh, proposing it at a rate of 0.18 spaces per unit. So this is slightly below the current rate of 0.2, uh, but it's above the new rate of 0.15 uh, that we're contemplating as part of the new zoning bylaw for properties within uh, a 10 to 15 minute walk of SkyTrain and Transit. Uh, staff support this variance, and we note that uh, initially there were more visitor parking spaces, but uh, we wanted to ensure that there was uh, a loading space incorporated into this application. Uh, so uh, we support the, the minor variance in order to have that loading space incorporated, given that the pr proposed visitor parking is still in line with what we're thinking uh, bringing forward uh, as part of our new zoning bylaw. So the application was received positively by the advisory design panel or ADP, uh, their February 3rd meeting, and the applicant has incorporated the recommendations into their updated drawings, which are included in your agenda. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this overview. Thank you. So uh, first, second reading of a bylaw to amend the official community plan bylaw in order to incorporate provisions for higher density, low rise residential uses at the properties addressed 5394, 5396, 5400 and 5402 207th Street that the bylaw cited as the city of Langley official community plan bylaw 2005 number 2600, amendment number 12, 2021, number 3159, be read a first and second time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. 
Councillor Martin, Councillor Sturdeboom for discussion. I have Councillor Sturdeboom and then Pahal, did you have your hand up or was that just a second? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And there isn't really much that I can add to Mr. Johansson's report. I can assure you that the uh, advisory design panel uh, looked at this very closely. Uh, this application was very well received with a lot of uh, um, interest in uh, design and uh, uh, some of the, uh, the very clever ways that uh, this will add uh, new life to that immediate area. Uh, so I uh, would speak in favor of this resolution. And uh, just because this particular application is coming in advance of the new official community plan for the city of Langley, it, it only demonstrates to me that the development community is chomping at the bit to do business in the city of Langley and that our development services team is on it. So uh, thank you again for your hard work, uh, Mr. Johansson, you and your team pulling this together. Uh, I will support this resolution and encourage my council colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And Mr. Johansson, did you have anything else to add about the actual bylaw or was that sufficient? Uh, yes, that is sufficient. My, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, the overview I just provided was meant to, you know, uh, provide description of the OCP amendment bylaw and the rezoning bylaw and proposed uh, development permit. We also have a report uh, in the agenda uh, regarding uh, just getting council's direction to refer this to uh, specific agencies as part of the OCP uh, referral process. Great, thank you. I just want to make sure that nothing was left out. That's all, thanks. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands, all those in favor, any opposed, that carries. Okay, OCP amendment bylaw number 3159, public consultation and adoption requirements. That council one direct staff to send copies of the official community plan amendment bylaw number 3159 at 5394, 5396, 5400, and 5402 207th Street to the following organizations and authorities for consultation prior to holding a public hearing on April 12, 2021, in consideration of the requirements set out in section 475 of the Local Government Act. Metro Vancouver, TransLink, Kwantlen First Nation, School District number 35. And number two, consider official community plan amendment bylaw number 3159 in conjunction with the 2021 to 2025 financial plan bylaw number 3151 and the regional liquid and solid waste management plans in accordance with section 4773 of the local government act. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Sturdeboom, Councillor Albrecht, any discussion on that? Councillor Sturdeboom, go ahead. Or was Sorry. that up? Last I time. Forgot. And that's okay. I, I, it's all good. Okay. So, any discussion on that? If not, I'll call the vote. All those in favor, and that carries. Okay. On to bylaw three one six zero zoning bylaw amendment and development permit number zero seven dash twenty. And I believe, Mr. Johansson, you are up again. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, as I described uh, previously, this is the uh, rezoning, uh, proposed rezoning bylaw uh, that forms part of the, uh, the application package before you. So staff recommend uh, moving this to uh, public hearing. Great, thank you so much. First, second reading of a bylaw to rezone the properties located at 5394, 5396, 5400 and 5402 207th Street from the RS1 multiple residential low density zone to the CD72 comprehensive development zone to accommodate a six story, 68 unit apartment development that the bylaw cited as the zoning bylaw 1996 number 2100, amendment number 172, number 3160 be read a first and second time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Stortaboom, Councillor Martin. And Councillor Martin, go ahead, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. I just, just want to point out um, on my page 163, the address says 5398, not 5396. 
I don't know if it makes a difference, but I just thought I'd point it out. Uh, I'm not sure for clarification. I have the right addresses as far as I know. Ms. Kenny, was the right addresses uh, read out? Um, Madam Mayor, are we talking about um, something on the actual agenda that's not correct? I'm not sure what page you're re referencing, um, Councillor Martin. Well, my page is 163, and it's the Zoning Bylaw 1996, 2100, Amendment 172. You read out the right <clears throat> address, Madam, Madam Mayor. The address in the report is wrong. Uh, Madam Mayor, if, if I may, uh... I'm correct. The addresses are 5394 and 5396. Not, uh, I think there was a 5398 in there. That might have been one that we missed. So yeah. uh, make sure that we have 5394 and 5396 are those addresses for the, the southernmost two lots there. Yeah, that's that's the one I'm talking about, Ms. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on that? Raise hand. Okay, all those in favor? And that carries. Thank you, Mr. Johansson. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, on to new and unfinished business. Uh, motions and notices of motion. So um, this is one that I am going to be bringing forward to raise disability and income assistance to a livable rate motion. So uh, the motion is that council endorses the following resolution and directs staff to forward copies to UBCM member local governments, local MLAs and MPs, as well as the provincial ministers responsible for social development, poverty reduction, finance and housing. This is the requesting this favorable consideration. Whereas, after many years of frozen income assistant rates and only minimal increases to disability benefits, the current provincial government increased rates for single people by $150 between 2017 and 2019. But most people who receive disability benefits or income assistance continue to live well below the poverty line. And whereas the provincial government added a $300 a month COVID benefit, for those receiving disability and income assistance, which temporarily reduced people's risk of losing their housing and increased their access to necessities, including food and medical supplies. But as of January 2021, the benefit has been reduced to $150 a month, and there is no commitment to provide additional support past March 2021. Be it resolved that the province of British Columbia permanently reinstate the automatic $300 a month benefit for people receiving disability benefits and income assistance and move to um, raise disability and income assistance to a livable rate that is above the market basket measure. I need a seconder on that, please. Councillor James, any discussion? No discussion. All right, call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, motion to hold the closed meeting that the council meeting immediately following this meeting be closed to the public as the subject matter being considered relates to items which comply with the following closed meeting criteria specified in section 90 of the community charter. One, a part of council meeting may be closed to the public if the subject matter being considered relates to or is one or more of the following. A, personal information about an identi identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, or agent of the municipality or another position appointed by the municipality. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Sturdivant, Councillor Paul. All those in favor, carries. All right, well, and that is, that comes to the end of our meeting. So thank you for everybody coming out. I know, I think everybody's left already, but um, motion that the meeting adjourn. 
Uh, Councillor Sturman, Councillor Wallace, all those in favor, and that carries. So we